Hi everyone, welcome to my show and this time I'm going to be talking about pantheism and panentheism which was a request from Gwen uh, on a comment on a previous video about imminence so I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. So um, let's get down to some definitions. Pantheism is the idea that the divine and nature are one so um, if you had a Venn diagram of the universe and um, the divine, it would be a single circle because in pantheism, they're the same thing. Uh, there is nothing outside the universe and the divine and the universe are one. Um, this is quite an old idea and it appears in a number of different religious traditions. Um, the earliest uh, expression of it in modern times was Spinoza's idea of the divine as nature, which he wrote Deus Sive Natura, because he wrote in Latin. And uh, similarly, much later, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright said, I believe in God, only I spell it nature. So um, some people confuse pantheism with polytheism. Well, polytheism is the belief in many gods. Those many gods can be imminent in nature, but it, pantheism is the idea of a, a single divine occupying the universe or being the universe. And typically in pantheism, there's no sense of a personal God. It's just that everything in nature is divine. And so although that feels like a very pagan idea, um, it appears in a number of different traditions, as I said, and um, because there's no personality to the divine in this system, um, it sort of feels not quite like paganism. Um, but obviously, the very friend pantheism and paganism are very mutually friendly ideas, if you see what I mean, because they both revere nature. So, to contrast that with panentheism, um, panentheism is the idea that the divine exists uh, both all pervading through the universe, but also beyond it. So it's both transcendent and imminent. So um, the divine encompasses the universe, but it, it also transcends the universe. So this idea also appears in a number of different religious traditions. And I found this quote from the Bhagavad Gita, which expresses what panentheism is really, really well. By me, all this universe is pervaded through my unmanifested form. All beings abide in me, but I do not abide in them. So that gives you the idea that Krishna is both containing the universe or sustaining the universe, but also transcends it. And um, there's a similar idea expressed in uh, one of the writings of the Apostle Paul, where he says, um, in him we live, move and have our being. And actually he was quoting from a pagan poet when he said that. Um, it was either Epimenides or Aratus and the poem is actually describing the relationship of Zeus to the universe. So um, Zeus was seen as both transcendent and imminent because in, hi in him we live, move and have our being. So um, Transcendence and imminence. So transcendence is the idea of something being beyond something else. It transcends it. Uh, whereas imminence is the idea of something being enfolded in or present in um, typically nature, right? And um, so you can have both transcendence and imminence in paganism. Uh, but paganism tends more to think about the divine or, and deities as being imminent in nature. So under every, in every tree, there's a tree spirit and in every holy well and every standing stone and every, you know, every nook and cranny of nature, uh, the idea that divinity is present and that there's an indwelling spirit to all these things. Uh, which obviously shades into animism, which is the idea that everything has a spirit, 
which is not quite the same as a single spirit all pervading everything. So animism is more like there is many spirits that are present, possibly with a substrate underlying that of, of spirit. So I think I tend more towards the animist worldview um, because I'm a polytheist and so those two things go together quite well, like many gods, many spirits, um, with possibly an underlying sort of ecosystem or substrate of spirit all pervading everything, but not having a consciousness as such. Okay, um, so I think it's important also to talk about there are two different kinds of transcendence. So there's uh, they've got a fancy name, of course, because uh, this is theology and we have to have fancy names. Um, so there's ontological transcendence and epistemological transcendence. So um, ontological transcendence, so ontology is all about being, right? So when we talk about uh, ontological transcendence as something that's that's transcendent by its very nature. So it's the nature of its being is to be outside, to be transcendent. Um, compare that with epistemological transcendence. So epistemology is the experience of knowledge. Um, so, uh, or the, the structure of knowledge. And so a tran an epistemological transcendence is having a transcendent experience. So for example, when you are in a crowd of other people and you feel carried away by emotion um, because you're all having a wonderful, listening to a beautiful piece of music or something, that's a transcendent experience. So that's epistemological transcendence. And we can compare that with the idea of imminence, um, which Michael York calls the preternatural. Uh, which I think is quite a useful term to contrast with the supernatural. Um, so imminence is where the divine is enfolded in or intertwined with the nate or even that nate that matter and spirit are one and that they are just you know like matter is a denser form of spirit and spirit is a less dense form of matter. Uh, so I think this is quite helpful to when we're thinking about what we mean by transcendence and what we mean by imminence. So what are the implications of these ideas for paganism? So if we go right back to the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, where he said, as above, so below, uh, it's the idea that the macrocosm and the microcosm are enfolded within each other and that um, or reflected within each other so um you know that to see the grain to see the world in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour that quote it's about that you know you can have giant river systems um and flows uh like of sand or mars uh, or you can have the smallest piece of lichen or a tree and they all have this kind of branching pattern so there's a um there's a similarity between the large large scale and the small scale and um so everything is reflected in everything else and the same the idea is that the same happens in spiritual matters that the the astral plane and the and the physical plane and all other planes of existence have similarities and echoes between them So one of the things that I find really attractive about the idea of imminence and um, and indeed the idea of um, pantheism um, is, and I wish there was a sort of a hybrid term for pantheism and polytheism because I'm definitely a polytheist, I like many gods, um, but I also want something to say that those gods are imminent in nature. Um, and, you know, I, I need a term that's like a hybrid of the two. Uh, maybe animism is that term, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, some years ago now, um, Alison Lee Lilly 
wrote uh, a beautiful piece. Um, so yes, got this lovely quote from Alison Lee Lilly, which for the natural polytheist who finds her gods in the rivers and mountains, in the deep rooted giants looming above the canopy and in the tiny creatures that move beneath them, ecology gives us a glimpse into a kind of living anatomy of the divine, a theology of physical as well as spiritual life. So in this way of looking at polytheism and the imminence of gods, uh, we can look at nature to find um, the source of our ethics and the source of comfort because of the beauty of nature. Um, so the idea that gods can shift and change and exist in, in mist or mountains or trees or um, other beautiful phenomena in nature um, gives you a more fluid understanding of what gods might be and also um, you know when we look at a beautiful scene in front of us um, we can see the face of the divine right in front of us and that is something that really appeals to me as an idea so um, I think that the idea of imminence and the divine in everything is really attractive in that sense because um, nature is beautiful and it's also the source of our existence uh, without the without the ecosystem on in which we live uh, move and have our being um, we would not survive so I think um, it's just really important to feel that connection to nature and be aware of our place in nature and that's why imminence is such an important idea for me so I'm not sure if we've got anywhere near the question of the difference between pantheism and panentheism and paganism um, I think that paganism can embrace a number of different theological standpoints um, I think that pantheism um, you know if you are a pantheist you can also be a pagan um, because paganism is very much about imminence and so is pantheism and um, if that's your underlying theology that's fine um, if you are a panentheist and you think that the divine also transcends the universe that's fine too you know um, that idea is woven throughout a number of different religious traditions and there's no particular reason why the gods can't be both transcendent and imminent um, but either way uh, I think for me the idea of imminence is pretty key in paganism and you know even if you're a pagan atheist um, you're presumably still getting some sort of spiritual connection or inspiration from nature and that's what it's all about so you know i i think that we shouldn't lose sight of our connection to nature and although pagans are very drawn to mythology and old stories and stuff um i think we must it's sad if we lose sight of the fact that the key impetus behind the pagan revival was this idea of the divine being imminent in nature and therefore you know we and we live on the earth and we need to take care of the earth and that's really important so we shouldn't lose sight of that so yeah that's it in a nutshell i think so just to say uh, if you enjoyed this presentation check out my books which are available from the dorian valiente shop and don't forget to hit that subscribe button uh, so you don't miss any of my shows and I hope you enjoyed this and um, bless it be.